Forced to work from home by your employer? Laid off or feeling depressed at home? Do you want to make money working from anywhere? We'll show you how to do it from your couch. It's time for another episode of the Work From Home Show. Coming to you from their homes in Austin, Texas and Tampa, Florida. Here are your hosts, Adam and Naresh. Welcome to another episode of the Work From Home Show. Shout out to all our homies, homeboys, homegirls, home trans, all the Work From Homers out there. We are once again joined by James Altucher, host of the James Altucher Show, a hedge fund manager and entrepreneur, founded more than 20 companies. He is the author of bestsellers such as the Choose Yourself Guide to Wealth, The Power of No, Because One Little Word Can Bring Health, Abundance, and Happiness, How to Be the Luckiest Person Alive, The Rich Employee, and I Was Blind, But Now I See. You've written so many books, and really, you've come to the limelight because of your blog, jamesaltucher.com. Your blog just really, really took off. I think you started writing, I want to say, in 2010. So tell us a little bit about, number one, why did you start writing your blog? And our, our listeners who go to jamesaltucher.com can see that James doesn't hold anything back. So why did you start writing about your personal problems, your depression issues, your anxiety problems, and do you have a business model for your blog that our listeners can try to emulate? Yeah, so in in 2010, I kind of was just, I think I was just like burnt out. Like I li- literally, I was like really burnt out, and I had recently gone broke for like the third or fourth time, and I was also, I had been a successful day trader for a while, but I had a, I had some bad day trading days. I didn't go broke from this. I was very cautious on day trading, but I just got sick of that. Uh, CNBC, I I was going on CNBC a lot to do, uh, you know, to talk about the markets and, you know, I had been a hedge fund manager for many years and, uh, and all my predictions on CNBC turned out later to be, I I don't want to sound like I'm bragging, but like in 2009, I would say when, just when the market was hitting bottom, I would say, Nope, the market's going to go straight up from here. Here's why. And everyone would laugh or, or when Facebook was offered a billion dollars by Microsoft in 2006, I would go on CNBC and say, Nope, this is going to be worth more than a hundred billion at some point. Everybody would laugh. And, and then eventually I just got tired of being laughed at on CNBC all the time and, and other channels that I would go on and everybody thought I was insane. And so I was just like, screw it. This is, this is miserable. And I've been writing for the wall street journal, for the financial times, for Yahoo finance, for lots of places, but the financial times lost their advertiser. So I stopped writing there. I'd written a bunch of financial books, but I couldn't get a new financial book published because my, my final financial book didn't do so well because it was published in the middle of the financial collapse. And, but nobody takes that into account. And so I just said, okay, I have no place to write. I'm just going to set up my blog. What do I write about? I don't want to write about stocks. That's so just annoying at this point. And I just, I I just started off like advice to my daughters and I would start writing all this really, you know, the way to be a good writer is you have to write something uncomfortable because if you're writing something that's comfortable, then somebody else has probably written this before. So like if I write, oh, everybody should do take care of their physical health. Well, yeah, sure. I've read that a million times before. If I write, well, okay, everybody should be around people who, who love them. Yeah, of course. That's been written a billion times before. So I just would start writing about like, I went broke and I wanted to kill myself and this is what I did. And I would just be brutally honest and I wouldn't leave a thing out. And people would be like, I would, and then I would post on Twitter, check out my blog post. And people would be like literally gasping. I could see it on Twitter. People would call me up and say, hey, are you okay? Are you, uh, do you have cancer or something? Like what's going on? One person I had worked with thought I was having a stroke. And I just started writing like that every single day. And I realized, and it built up my audience a hundred times as much as my audience was on stock picking. And, and I had a pretty big audience then. And you know, at some point I decided, you know, this would make a good book, but I don't want to publish. I don't want to go through the regular 
um, mainstream publishing. And I, I, I hired a really good professional editor. I hired a really good designer. I hired a marketing company. And so I acted like a mini publishing company and I published it on my own. And that was choose yourself. And since then I've written a whole bunch of other books. I've written 22 books overall, but, uh, it's, you know, you know, I, I always think about writing. You have to say something no one else is saying. You have to say something that, you know, is really honest and sincere to you. You have to tell your story and it's gotta be unique. And ideally you tell other people's stories as well. So you show that you're not the only one going through this, that, that a lot of people who people admire are also going through this. And, you know, that's been the source of a bunch of my books until my, so I, I just finished the book actually. Uh, and I submitted it to my, and now I'm using a mainstream publisher, you know, for the first time in a long time. I used I, for, for, for 12 years, I only used mainstream publishers. Then for eight years, I've mostly used, I mostly self-published. But now I'm using a Harper Collins for my next book. Sold out to and the man. I did. Well, you know, every now and then it's good to cycle and and learn and, and see what's interesting. And I have a very good editor at Harper Collins who I've worked with in the past. And I knew she would make this book a, a great book. And I, I really wanted to be my best book ever. And it's called it's called Skip the Line. And it's basically you could switch passions or interests at any point in your life and very quickly become one of the top 1% in your field in that new area of interest. Because right now we're going through this where everybody got fired during this pandemic and people are finding, hey, I'm really just interested in cooking. I wasn't interested in being a paralegal at Procter & Gamble. And uh, well, you can, here's, here's how to skip the line in cooking and be in the top 1% in your field. And everyone's gonna tell you, you can't do it, but you can. And this is how, and, and here's how, but, and then they'll say, but don't, don't I have to work 10,000 hours? Isn't there, isn't there that 10,000 hour rule to be the best at something? And I show how there's, there are better ways than the 10,000 hour rule to become the, uh, it, not the best in the world, but to be in the top 1%. So there's a big difference, but to be in the top 1% is good enough to monetize, uh, an interest. And that's, that's, that's the goal. And my very next book after that, which I'm about to start this evening is called quarantine love. And I want to make it a Harlequin <laughs> romance book. And I'm determined. I've been wanting to do a Harlequin romance for the past 30 years. And now I'm going to start. <laughs> so is your business model for your blog essentially then just getting getting your writing practice in? No. So it was at first. But there's this theory I have. I call it the spoken wheel theory. Your The wheel is your core interest. Like let's say it's fantasy sports. So you write, you know, you have your fantasy sports blog and your and 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 that's at the well that basically there's a wheel and then there are spokes. So one spoke of let's say your interest, your passion is fantasy sports. One spoke is uh a blog, which you there's ways to monetize a blog, but I, I don't necessarily. Uh another spoke might be making a TV show about fantasy sports. Another spoke might be making a podcast about fantasy sports, another spoke might be making a business uh, where people could create their fantasy sports teams and you have a league and blah, blah, blah. Another spoke might be uh, having a four pay newsletter where every week you send out your picks uh, and on and on and on. Uh, so whatever's at your wheel of your passion, you find enough spokes, you're going to find many spokes that make money and have multiple streams of income. So with my blog, you know, I still had kind of a, a lot of knowledge about finance and investing and so on, but I also had this kind of, for lack of a better phrase, uh, you know, self-help leaning and also a, a you know writing leaning, and uh, and also an entrepreneurial leaning. So uh, I started different newsletters and courses coming out of my blog, uh, and and a podcast on entrepreneurship, on investing, on peak performance, on writing. Uh, you know, I had. On my podcast a few weeks ago, I had Chuck Palahniuk who wrote Fight Club. I had on uh, Mark Cuban the other day about entrepreneurship. I've had on John McAfee about how to be batshit insane and get away with it somehow uh, after you sell a company for billions. And uh, so, uh, you know, so the podcast is 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 one tool. Uh, my online courses are another tool. An online um, newsletter is another another spoke in that wheel. 
on the blog itself, I don't do this, but you could monetize with affiliate links. Like I could say, here's all my resources. And then I get an affiliate fee if anybody clicks on that those links and makes money. And so there's there's many ways to to monetize uh, an interest, I will call it. And a blog is one of them, but you kind of should do all of them at the same time. And that that's that's what I always try to do. Now, I don't really consider personally, I mean, with the abundance of blogs out there and the abundance of everything out there, how, how would you distinguish yourself if you were just starting out now? Because I mean, a lot of people, they see, I mean, there's probably, you know, multi-millions in terms of the number of blogs out there. How do you distinguish yourself? And, and I yeah. have a follow-up to that, yeah. James. Same question also applied to how do you do the same thing for self-published books? There's so many now, there's so many self-published books. How do you get the word out? Yeah, and and it's the same for podcasts too. I mean, there's there's nine hundred thousand pod there's two million podcasts. There's nine hundred thousand active podcasts. The average podcast gets two hundred downloads a month, and uh, and those are on the active ones. So, you know, it's it's the same question all around, and yet it gets done. And and part of it is, part of it is by doing something unique. So if I was going to do my blog now, I don't think I would start it in the same way. Like I think, I think when I started it in 2010, I'll call it the category of failure porn wasn't a category. And I think now many people in kind of self-help or narrative nonfiction or whatever talk about their failures first and almost as if it's a badge of honor without, and, and so I would have a hard time distinguishing myself. I mean, maybe you could distinguish yourself with, with really good writing, but um, I would have to think of a category that I'm really fanatically interested in and have something unique to say about it. And at the time I was fanatically interested in, in writing and being a good writer. And I was fanatically interested in, uh, failure and I mixed it in always with my knowledge of finance and, 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 and the economy. So I would, if, if, if the market was crashing every now and then I would throw in a post, like here's 10 reasons why the market's going straight up from here. And, you know, I throw that in occasionally. So it would keep, I would keep every aspect of my audience. And I, I did this spoken wheel approach to my blog. So I viewed the blog as a wheel, but uh, as the wheel, but then I would write for TechCrunch about my more entrepreneurship oriented posts. I would write for the wall street journal and business insider for my more investing related posts. I would write for the yoga journal about yoga related posts. I'd write for you know, literary websites about my more story driven posts. So I built up all these audiences from different parts of my universe. And that's another way to bring, I would answer not questions nonstop on Quora. So I have, I think I'm the third most followed U S citizen on Quora after Jimmy Wales and the founder and uh, Quora has got 200 million users. And so, you know, if you're writing well and you're writing unique things, then you're going to attract followers on each platform and eventually you drive that traffic back to your blog. But, you know, maybe if I was starting now, I don't know if I would go start with a blog. I'd probably start by being very um, uh, active on Reddit. Like I'd write 10 times a day on Reddit or more. I'd be very active on Facebook and different Facebook groups and different LinkedIn groups in different um you know, I would, I would, I would answer two or three Quora questions a day and I would just build up my, you know, presence. So people would know, oh, James just answered this question. He's the guy who seems to know about X, Y, and Z. And you establish that expertise by writing on other sites and the blog sort of comes last. You kind of have to build your presence first. So I was an expert on investing and so I wrote for 10 years for thestreak.com, Yahoo Finance, Wall Street Journal, FD, all these sites before I started a blog. So I already had uh, an audience and expertise. And then I developed other expertises be because I pointed my audience to, oh, here's this article on TechCrunch. He's an he knows a lot about entrepreneurship. Here's this article on yoga. I didn't know this guy knows yoga. Here's this article about Star Wars. I've never seen that kind of take on Star Wars. That's really interesting. I'm going to follow this guy on Twitter. And then on Twitter, I'd post links to my blog. So there's all sorts of different ways, but, but I guess I would start off by saying, find an area where you, where you're fanatically interested and you, you could really say something, you have a unique vision about it. Okay. Awesome. 
Uh, James, going back, and, and Adam, you're going to have to make note to edit this to the beginning of the episode. But anyway, James, going back to the, the work from home movement, what is your outlook on this movement? Is working from home the future of industry? And also, how does the gig economy tie into this? So, so it's, it's, it's very interesting because one time I was visiting LinkedIn. LinkedIn wanted me to do a little bit of consulting. And by the way, uh, remember that I, trick I told you I, I would write down 10 ideas a day and yep. to exercise? Well, sometimes I would send those ideas to, I, I would write like 10 ideas for Amazon, 10 ideas for Google, just, just to exercise the idea muscle. But sometimes I would send them to Google or Amazon and Facebook and wherever. So I've actually, if the idea, most of the time the ideas were bad, but if the ideas were good, usually I would be able to, somebody would call me and want to talk more about them. So I have visited, because of this approach, I have visited um, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Quora, uh, Airbnb, LinkedIn. And one time I was visiting uh, LinkedIn and uh, 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 I asked them, and I was doing some consulting about something else, but I asked them, how many of your searches per day are related to the gig economy? And they said, hardly any, like 0.3% of our searches for jobs are related to the gig economy. And then I asked them like a year or so later, and it was like 2%. So it had multiplied by seven in a year or so. And so the gig economy is not going away. And in fact, one thing that's happening with this quarantine and pandemic is that th there's three words that ring true for me. One is uh, the word remote, of course, that everything is going to move more and more remote, whether it's obviously food delivery, but online working is going to, I've talked to a lot of CEOs in the past few weeks. Every single one of them is talking employee by employee. How many employees can stay at home? Even if you have to go to work occasionally, how many hours a week can you stay at home? And so on. Uh, so, so delivery, I mentioned work, uh, 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 education obviously is going to be a big factor and, and that's a whole other category in itself. So, so, uh, remote is, is going to be big. Acceleration is going to be big too. So if, if drones were going to replace online delivery people in 10 years, well now it's going to be three years. And even in North Dakota right now, they're testing drones, delivering food to your backyards. And, and so that's going to start happening. It's self-driving. Maybe originally it was going to be 10 years from now. Now it's going to be two years from now. Who knows? Uh, if you were going to get a divorce in 10 years, now you're going to get a divorce at the end of this pandemic. And I, I'm not going to get a divorce as that, soon actually. as the courts open. I know you're not. We, we've yeah. talked about it on our show. We had an entire episode on being friendly with each other while being locked down at home or working from home. It's a new environment. It's a new environment. And not only that, I mean, I was talking to someone who's a private investigator. They're getting calls through the roof that they need to spy on someone who's actually living and staying in the same apartment as the person who called the yeah. PI. And mm -hmm. apparently one out of four people who use Ashley Madison right now, which is the, you know, their motto is they're a dating site, but their motto is life is short, have an affair. Yep. So one out of four people using the dating site are actually meeting <laughs> their, meeting their illicit encounter during these lockdowns when you're supposed to be social distancing. So it's just a crazy world. But anyway, that's the acceleration theme. And then local is a third theme that a lot more people are concerned about. Hey, are all these stores actually closing in my local area? And there's going to be a lot more thinking about local news, local deliveries, local services. And, you know, so, so, but I do think, so, so, so working at home is, is, is going to be not only, in, not only going to be, happening, but there's going to be a lot of business models, models that we can't even conceive of yet involved in working at home. So content creation obviously can happen at home. Like you could do a podcast from home, but just all working at home is going to happen. There's gonna be a lot more online education. There's going to be a lot more crowdsourcing. For instance, there's a website called crowdmed, uh, crowdmed.com where somebody can post, uh, an illness, like here are my symptoms. And then the crowd will diagnose. And if your diagnosis, if you're in the crowd and you offer a diagnosis and your diagnosis is correct, you get money. So it's a, it's a, it's a, an odd little side hustle. It's like a new and WebMD or something. 
it's kind of like an MM WebMD, except uh, like I'm not a doctor, right? But now on CrowdMed, they call me a medical detective of rank six or something like that. And, you know, doctors are like rank three. And uh, I've just submitted my first diagnosis. I'm like a, I'm like a doctor right now. I say, I say, somebody, and you know, it turns out there's research that this is why people go for a second opinion because doctors don't know everything. And there's research actually that a crowd is often 75% more successful than an actual MD. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's going to be all these business models combined with side hustles and gigs. Like, uh, you know, there's, there's so many interesting side. I don't, I don't even like the word side hustle or gig. Cause some of these places you can make legitimate, like a lot of money, but there's a, a website quirky.com where you can just draw an invention. Like, let's say you have an invention for a, a toilet that takes your temperature and uh, you draw it on a napkin and you upload it to the site. Now, if other people start saying, Hey, this is a good idea. Then the next person says, here's a company that manufactures toilets. And then the next person says, here's how you could put a thermometer in a toilet that could sense your temp that could take your temperature. And then, and then someone takes the final step, like here's how you can actually manufacture it. Now the site quirky starts selling the product and everybody who was involved in the invention making process splits the royalties with the site. And so there's these amazing, weird and crazy models. Uh, you could even, you could sell you there's carver carvertizing. You could sell ads on the, on the side of your car. There's sitter stream, Dot com. You could be a babysitter through Zoom because everybody's got their kids at home. Uh, you could be an online tutor, of course. I'm taking, I'm going to a site called LessonFace.com, and they teach all these musical lessons. So I'm taking beatboxing lessons for twenty five dollars a session from the the champion of the United Kingdom on beatboxing. <laughs> and you know, there's just amazing stuff you could do online now, and I think that's going to only grow. <laughs> Can you give us a little beatbox? No, I've only, <laughs> I've only had two lessons, but, okay. you, but the instructor, his name's, his name's Subsonic. You can find him on YouTube if you Google <laughs> Subsonic and beatboxing. He's very good. And I'm just, I'm just struggling. I'm a struggling <laughs> student. So what do you, what, who do you read or what did you read or, um, where do you go for resources whenever you want to educate yourself? Well, there's two types of reading I like to do. One is I like to read to be a better writer. And you could only read, you can't read nonfiction to be a better writer. I mean, some people would disagree, but the best writing is in fiction. And the reason is, is because fiction writers spend their whole lives trying to be better writers. Nonfiction writers spend their whole lives learning U.S. history, and then they write about it. So almost by definition, nonfiction writers won't be the best writers. But there are some exceptions. Like, I like Robert Greene. Uh, I just, I reread probably for the fourth or fifth time the book Mastery recently, um, it, while I was kind of writing my book, Skip the Line, I also reread Nassim Taleb's book, Anti-Fragile, which I, I, I love the concepts in Anti-Fragile. It's a, it's a tough read. But, um, and then on, fic, on the fiction side, I'm rereading. By the way, rereading is really important because have you ever noticed when you've read a book, you don't really remember it like a week later? And I kind of think, People only remember, and this holds for me at least, I only remember about 1% uh, of a book. Even if I love loving every page of the book, I only remember, remember about 1% of the book uh, a couple weeks later. And so rereading is very important. I always remember new things. But the same holds true for fiction. So I read, I read really high-quality fiction writers, mostly um, short stories, some novels, some poetry, uh, just because I think, I think short story writers – they have to kind of get the essence of what they're trying to say in as few words as possible. And it's really the best short story writers are really amazing. They're like combination between poets and great novelists. And uh, so, so I, I always read those. I, I read before I write every day. I always read fiction. I read nonfiction. And I'll usually read a book about uh, games um, just to kind of get those juices flowing. So I'll read a book about chess or something with chess puzzles or something like that. Or, or poker puzzles. Uh, but yeah, n nonfiction, I've been reading a lot of, uh, I actually am reading a book about U.S. history right now by Jill Lepore, uh, who teaches history at Harvard, uh, which is a, which is a scam, but I, but still makes her qualified. And, uh, it's a great, it's a great book called the truths or these truths. And I'm up to, um, 
I'm up to uh, William McKinley right now. Awesome. Well, James, what we recorded two just really, really awesome episodes with you. Thanks oh, so much for coming on the, the Work From Home show. You're the host of the James Altucher show. People can check that out at jamesaltucher.com. And all your books, I named them uh, er- earlier, just too many to name. But check them out. Just type in James Altucher on Amazon. And they are, every single one of them is worth it. The value that you get from those books, I can tell you, it's multiplied times hundreds of thousands of dollars. For oh, me. thank you so much. It's so <laughs> nice to say. I really, I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you. And choose yourself financial.com that houses all of your newsletters and a few other tidbits there. James, any other final thoughts, final words, anything you want to plug? Well, well, yeah, I just want to mention, if you really want to find me, I'm James Altucher on TikTok. So that's, <laughs> that's where you can find all my current best material. And, um, no, nothing, nothing else. I really appreciate you guys having me on, and I, I hope uh, to come on again. And you know, Naresh, Adam, thank you. You're, you this is this is a great show. Uh, you, you've known you for a long time, Naresh. I'm I'm so happy you're doing this. And and look, it's really scary what's happening out there right now. Anyone who claims to really know what's going to happen next is doesn't. There's there's no way to know. There's so much uncertainty. I'm here in New York City, and people ask me all the time, "Will movie theaters reopen?" And a lot of people are saying absolutely not. They, it, it, movie theaters are going out of business. But you know what? I don't know. And I think those three words are the most important words you can say right now. Yeah, well, there you have it. You heard it from the man himself. He chose himself. He, I chose myself thanks to him. And I think our listeners should think about choosing themselves as well. So to all our homies listening at home, until next time, keep on working from home.